you. Come on, let's just give our God another hand of praise. I, I, I'm glad that we have all of those who are with us virtually, but if you were in this house, you could feel something totally different. If you were in this house, it's altogether different. You, 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 can't, you can't feel this virtually. You can't feel this virtually. you deserve it, Lord. He's not a virtual God. He's a real God. But he shows up virtually. I said he's a real God. But he shows up virtually. And when you come in the house, you can't help but feel his presence. He doesn't come all the time. But every now and then when he shows up, you can feel it. What a, what a testimony. Genesis 1. Genesis 1. Lord, have mercy. Genesis 1. Everybody ought to be able to find this. Genesis 1. Verse 1 and 2. Genesis 1. Verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In our focal verse, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. I want to talk about empty pews and empty people. You may be seated. Empty pews and empty people. I'm beginning a new series. I've tagged God and emptiness. COVID has come and has introduced us to a lot of public health issues, guns, addictions, violence, and even COVID-19. Two Harvard professors, Tyler Vanderweel, an epidemiologist, the other Brendan Case, a specialist in human flourishing, did an article in which they titled, Empty Pews are an American Health Crisis. It caught my attention. Empty Pews are an American Health Crisis. Two facts they discussed. Number one, church attendance is down. Number two, going to church is good for your health. Two facts that the Harvard doctors said. Church attendance is down, but church is good for your health. A Pew Research poll in 2011 said that 43% of Americans attend church every week. In 2020, the same study found that only 29% attend church every week. And this was before COVID. Amen, somebody. And in this study, healthcare professionals indicate that religious service attenders had far fewer deaths of despair, deaths by suicide, drug overdose, or alcohol than people who never attended services, reducing those deaths by 68% for women and 33% for men. 
Now you know why more women come to church than men. Because it's healthier for them. Because they have to deal with men. Amen. I thought all the sisters would shout on that part. But the study said those who attend church weekly have greater longevity, greater social support, greater meaning in life, greater life satisfaction. They have better cancer and cardiovascular disease survival. They have greater desires to volunteer. They have less depression, less divorce, less suicide, less smoking, less substance abuse. In other words, you need to go to church so you can be healthy. Have I got any witnesses? No scientist or historian can improve upon the first few words in verse 1. It says, in the beginning... God, not the president, not the CDC, not the doctors, not the epidemiologists. In the beginning, God, no scientist, no historian can improve upon that fact. This simple statement refutes the atheist who says there is no God. The agnostic who claims we cannot know God. The polytheist who worships many gods, the pantheist who says that all nature is God, the materialist who claims that matter is eternal and not created, and the fatalist who teaches that there is no divine plan behind creation and history. So when I looked at this passage, in the beginning, God, it reminds me of what Paul said to the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 19. He said, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul says that it's God's intention that every one of us be filled and not empty. When you look at Ephesians 5, 18, Paul says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Every child of God should not be empty. They should be filled with His Spirit. So then what do you do when you're holding on to things that God is removing? What do you do when the stuff that's emptying you, God is trying to remove from you, but you're trying to hold on to it? Look at the limits of COVID, the isolation, the social distancing, the staying home, the, when you met with your neighbors because we couldn't go anywhere, so we got closer to our neighbors. I want everything from March 2020 to August 2022 that we have suffered tremendous loss, death, businesses, income, freedom, pressure, equilibrium, imbalance, everything that's been knocked off of its course. I want it back. But God says, but what about I may be trying to remove it? Can I talk to you a minute? This is interesting to me because when you look at the emptiness that's in this text, God did not cease to be what he was and what he is essentially and what he was and is eternally. Even in the emptiness of earth, God was still full. Let me slow down. In the midst of emptiness, 
God was still God. Let me back up. In the beginning, God created. And he created all of this emptiness, but he was still full in the midst of the emptiness. So that in order to deal with the emptiness, God had to do the filling. Ride with me right through here. Write this down. It's amazing how heavy the weight of emptiness can feel. How much room it can take up in your soul. How much pain can be caused by something that isn't even there. It's empty. But yet, it's heavy. It's shallow. But yet, it's deep. But while we may see the emptiness of our lives as our greatest problem, can I tell you something? That's not how God sees it. Emptiness may be a problem for you, but emptiness is not a problem for God. Because when emptiness shows up, God is at his best. I'm trying to help somebody here. When God looks into the empty places of our lives, he sees his greatest opportunity. God does his best work in the emptiness of our lives. When you start looking at the insatiable cravings for things that don't satisfy you. Talk to me if you can. When you start looking at the relational disappointments and loneliness that you feel. When you start looking at the frustration and how you're frustrated when you search for purpose and you're searching for meaning. When it's relentless desire for comfort and security seems to be empty. When ongoing struggles to live with, with losses and emptiness and unfulfilled dreams. What do you do when everything you do seems empty? Ah, pastor, what do you do when your life is empty? What do you do when your marriage is empty? What do you do when your job is empty? What do you do when your bank account is empty? What do you do when your church is empty? What do you do when the pew is empty? What do you do when the people in the pew are empty? What do you do when the people who are tuned in are empty? I got some good news for you. First thing I see in the text is desolation. Can you say desolation? The text says it was formless and empty. Now, I'd have been all right if it was formless. But it's formless and it's empty. I'd have been all right if it's empty, but it's formless and empty. Formless suggests it's desolation. Can you say desolation? And when you look at Job chapter 26 verse 7, if anybody can tell us about desolation, Job can tell us. Job says in verse 7, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. Job says, let me tell you about how filling God is. That when everything you have has been lost, when you are empty and you start looking up, God is bigger than the sky. He says, when you look around, God is bigger than the earth. When it looks like nothing is going your way, God is working on something. Can I say this to you? God intended for the earth to be empty so that he could fill it. Let me say it. Come here. God intended for you to be empty, for me to be empty, so he can fill us. Talk to me if you can. God does his best work with empty. Emptiness has never been a problem for God. God works to feel emptiness and he fills it with grace. He fills it with hope. And the psalmist says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. God is filling you.
Can I say this to you? This is what I learned about God. He is a fulfilling God. God has the power to create something out of nothing. I used to say that God stood on the scaffold of nothing and broke the silence of a not yet universe with his own voice and said, let there be light. But then after I'd been preaching a while, I figured out that nothing didn't even exist. The scaffold didn't even exist. The only thing that existed was God. And God stood out on himself in the midst of emptiness and took everything that was in him and poured it into that which was empty. Good God Almighty. Brothers and sisters, when he spoke, light catapulted into darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. And without a generator or a power source, light catapulted into this darkness. And before he hung the sun as a yellow ball of glowing gases at precisely 93 million miles away with mathematical precision, if he'd have brought it too close, we'd have burned up. If it were too far away, we'd have froze to death. God was already here. Before the Big Bang Theory existed, God was already here. In fact, he created the Big Bang. Talk to me if you can. Before he gave the crimson beauty to the meander's robe, before he capped the mountains with the whiteness of snow and gave the pale splendor to the moon and the quiet majesty of the midnight, God was already here. Before he gave liquidity to water and viscosity to the oil, God was already here. Before he gave whiteness to wetness to water, whiteness to snow and greenness to grass, God was already here. And it was that great God who stood out in the midst of nothing and spoke to the emptiness and said, mm. I wish I had more time. Brothers and sisters, this passage shows us God's feeling of the empty earth. When God looked at the condition of the earth, then God changed it. Come here. When God looked at your condition, my condition he changed it you liked yourself just the way you are but God said no I don't like none of you he said you must be born again and here's what I want to tell you until you acknowledge your condition God won't change it until you acknowledge your condition God won't change you when I looked at this passage all I could see was chaos wasteness Emptiness, darkness, all are symptoms of being without God. If you're empty today, it could be that you're without God. If you're lonely today, it could be that you are without God. If you're struggling today, it could be that you are without God. If you are in a dark place, it could be that you are without God. This is God bringing shape and then fullness to the formless and the empty. If you want God to bring shape to your life, fullness to your life, you need to acknowledge only what you do for Christ. You experience emptiness when all you see is darkness. That's the second thing. He said darkness was over the face of the deep. And now, this, this messed me up. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the deep is deception. In other words, the darkness and the deepness is deceiving. Okay, slow down, Pastor. They missed it. See, when things are dark in your life, that's when it looks like you're falling in the deepest of despair and then darkness comes so you can't see how to get out talk to me if you can can, can I can I give you a question how did God deal with the darkness I, I believe this will help everybody if darkness ever comes into your life 
you want to know how to deal with it. How do I deal with it, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. Let me show you how God dealt with it. You, you got your Bible open? Look at verse 3. It says, and God said. You thought I was going to drop something deep on you. And God said. In your darkest hour, stop listening to E.F. Hutton and start listening for God. But not only does it say, and God said, but then look at verse 5. And God called. Oh my goodness. He said it. And then when he said it, he called what he said. I used to be slow too. My daddy said, Rene. That's what he called me, Rene. I don't know why. That's what he, that's what he called me. Rene. Boy, come here. Now, wait a minute. You already said Rene. I mean, <laughs> ain't nobody else coming but me. But see, he want to make sure you understand, I called you by your name. I said your name. But I called you by your position. Boy, come here. And whenever your daddy called you, you recognize your place. You missed it. When God calls you, you recognize your place. And when he calls you, you ought to say, yes. But now, I wouldn't be a good expositor if I didn't show you what else is in the text. Notice verse 6, verse 9, verse 11, verse 14, verse 20, verse 24, verse 26, and verse 29. And you know what it said? And God said. And every time he said something, things changed. Every time he said something, things change. Now watch this. When it starts out, it says, and God said, and then it says, call. Notice verse 5, verse 8, and verse 10. He didn't have to call but three times. Isn't that something? Father, Son, Holy Ghost. See, he didn't have to call but three times. Because see, every time he called it, each piece was connected to the next piece. So when he called the water to existence, then the fish showed up. The fish didn't show up and then he called the water. Because that's not how God works. Brothers and sisters, here's what I've discovered. You have to learn to see and hear God in the dark. When I was in quarantine, upstairs, in jail, uh, the first night in quarantine, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I looked left, I mean right, and I looked left, and I looked right, I looked left, where am I? That's what came to my mind. Where am I? Where am I? And then it hit me. Fool, you in your house. Okay, okay. The, the windows were closed. It was dark. I couldn't see. And I'm trained that when I see light, I automatically wake up. Because you can't get ahead in the bed. So when I see light, my eyes just come open. I, I don't need a clock. When I see light, my eyes just open up. And I'm in this dark room, and I don't even know where I am. And it hit me when I put my hand over there. It was empty. I was in jail without the bail. For two weeks in jail. I'm just making sure y'all understand. 
who run the house. I'm just making sure you understand. Uh, I need you to see this. Sometimes God uses the darkness to make us come to the light. Sometimes God uses the darkness to find out what he is worth to us. Now, I couldn't have orchestrated this any better. I know it's the Holy Spirit. The purpose of worship is to glorify God. But in that worship, God transfers his life into our life. People feel empty because of the lack of a transferred life. When life is transferred, it is unexplainable. It is supernatural. The church becomes what the church sings. The church becomes what the church sings. Church is not about what you are looking at. It's what you are looking for. The preacher can only take people where their heart is. So if the preacher's heart is not geared toward worship, the people won't be geared toward worship. Amen, somebody. L let me see if I can't explain it like this. Outside on the pole, the light pole is a transformer. It is a device that's used in the power transmission of electric energy. The transmission current is AC. It is commonly used to decrease or increase the supply voltage within a change in the frequency between circuits. The transformer works on basic principles of electric magnetic induction and mutual induction. What did you just say? I'm glad you asked. In every one of our lives, the Holy Spirit is the power that God uses to transmit a decrease or increase in power through the preacher after you hear the word of God. That's AC. After Christ. After Christ has come into your life, you can't explain it. You don't understand it. It's supernatural. The best you can do is say it in a song. What a wonderful change had been wrought in my life since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy over oh my soul like the sea billow roll since Jesus came into my life. When he comes into your life, he transforms your life like the transformer changes electricity into power. So, Brother Arthur, Brother John, the church becomes what the church sings. Everything starts with worship. If you shut worship down in a church, the percentage of the people touching God is greatly diminished. You may touch them with your gift. But when the gift is gone, the touch is gone. If we access God in worship, our entire destiny and life changes. If you're bored in worship, it could be. That you haven't seen him. If you were trying to figure out why they keep singing them songs over and over again, it could be because they saw him and you didn't see him. I, I was watching Brother John, and, and you know, usually Brother John is really concentrating and he's, he's really... Focus, you know, really paying attention. Makes a lot of faces. If you watch Brother John, he'd make a lot of faces when he's playing. He didn't know I'd be watching. He'd be making all kind of faces. He'd be trying to tell him. 
But then when his wife was up there singing, he was like, I saw you. I saw you, Brother John. I saw you. Because I could hear, that's my baby right there. She's singing for Jesus, singing for Jesus. And he kept playing extra notes because she was happy and he was getting happy because she was happy. I'm trying to tell you, when you see God, everybody gets happy. I got to get out of here. We fill up with the world, but we have no appetite for the word. When God spoke, that was the word. Let me prove it to you. Watch this. Pull out your phone. Pull out your phone. Pull out your phone. I know you had it tucked away. Pull it out. Pull it out right now. Pull it out. Pull it out. All right. Now I want you to touch it so it'll come on. Touch it so it'll come on. Now just pass it over to the other person next to you so they can see it. Look at all them apps they got on their phone. Look at all them apps. The home screen is full of apps. You fill up the home page with all those apps and you'll have enough room for anything else. You fill up your life with all that junk and you don't have any space for anything else. I went to my dentist the other day and he said to me he's got to go to his dentist. My dentist said he got to go to his dentist. He got a few cavities got to be filled. He said you would think as a dentist I would quit eating sugar. That's what he said. This is what I told him. Well, if I got a dentist that doesn't eat sugar, I'm going to get a new dentist. Because I need a dentist to know what I go through when I go to the snack cabinet. Amen. Because desserts and sweets were made for me. God made them with me in mind. That's why I'm thankful I am not a diabetic. I don't have the sugar. That would be a punishment. Amen, somebody. But A.W. Tozer says this in his book, The Pursuit of God. Write this down. The blessedness of possessing nothing. A.W. Tozer says we need to learn the blessedness of possessing nothing. In essence, he says that God is gracious to remove those things that possess us. And until you come to realize you blessed when you have nothing, over and against being blessed when you have everything. You see, what we keep preaching is that you're blessed because you have a lot. But I came to tell you, no, you're blessed when you have nothing because God is going to give you what you need. I got to get out of here. Look at your home screen on your phone. You got Facebook. TikTok, Netflix, YouTube, your bank, Chick-fil-A, all on the front home page so you can have quick access. But how many have the Holy Bible on the front page? How many have downloaded the Bible on your front page? Or do you have to go through three or four pages to get to the Bible? I got to go. I got to go. Here's the last thing. I got to cut across the field. Here's the third thing. After the desolation, after the darkness, God did something about it. <laughs> See, you thought I was going to say something deep. When God sees our condition, based on his word, he's obligated to do something about it. Let me show you. It said the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Because remember, the deep means deception. The deep means to deceive you. The darkness hides the deception so you can't see it. Isaiah says it like this in 48, 45, 18. He says, but this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. God created the earth to be inhabited.
But not only did he create the earth to be inhabited, he created your body to be inhabited with his spirit. And watch what happens when desolation comes and darkness comes. The spirit starts hovering. And when it starts hovering, it starts shaking up stuff. Things start trembling. And here's what gets me with this passage. The spirit of God moves in the chaos and the darkness. This is what I came to tell you. If chaos is in your life, if darkness is in your life, that's when God starts moving. And what you ought to say is, God, do a work in me but also do a work through me. In all of my limitations, in all of my losses, in all of my loneliness, in all of my disappointments, in all of my boredom, in all of my philosophical views and ideas, God do something in me. I'm learning to live in the mystery of God where I don't know what God is doing. But I'm learning how to just live with it and know that whatever he's doing, it's got to be for my good. Because if you can understand the things of God, then you don't need God. He fills his emptiness with his word. And you look at this chapter, he fills it with his word and he says, first of all, let there be light. Then let there be life. Then let there be beauty. Then let there be abundance. Let there be purpose. Let there be meaning. Let there be a relationship. Can I tell you this? Emptiness is not a problem for God. Emptiness is a problem for us. And I came to tell you, if you feel empty today, take it to the Lord. I'm reminded of a scene in the movie, Color Purple. They were at Harpo's juke joint. And there was some music going on at the church. And the singer in the juke joint was singing. And the louder she got, the louder the church got. Have I got any witnesses? And her daughter was in the church while the mama was in the juke joint. The mama was in the juke joint. The daughter was in the church. And the daddy was preaching. And the daughter started singing, yes, 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 Lord. Have I got any witnesses? She went on saying, oh, yes. My soul says yes. Have I got any witnesses? And the girl went on to say, if I were you, I would say yes. I would say, speak, Lord. Speak to me. Oh, speak, Lord. What you want, speak to me. I was so blind. I was so lost. Until you spoke to me. And the next thing I saw was the mama left the juke joint. And the mama started running toward the church. Have I got a witness? And the mama went in the choir stand by the daughter. And the mama picked up a, 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 the microphone. And the mama started saying, oh, speak, Lord. Speak to me. I came to tell you if you're empty today. Call out to God and say, speak, Lord. Speak to me. Talk to me, Lord. Tell me what you want me to do. It's dark. I'm lonely. I'm empty. But speak to me. I double dog day. Tell him, speak to you. In your emptiness. And God will fill you. I'm coming back next week. Talk about being empty again. Because if you're going to be in the pew and you come in here empty, 
I don't need you to leave out of here empty. I need you to leave out here with a word. And if you don't get anything else, when you go to work Monday, you tell them the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, but God spoke. And everything came into existence. You tell everybody you come in contact with, if they empty, tell them God wants to fill them. But you have to want God to fill you. Let's stand all over this house.